Oh, and we are on the air, everyone. So I call this uh, city council meeting to order. We have no one for the open forum. So would everybody please stand to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> and we have the STEM RDLS fifth graders who will start us with the Pledge of Allegiance. Children? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Wow, that was great. You guys did a great job. Thank you. So at this time, I'd ask the council's approval of the minutes of the special city council work session of May 12th, 2015, the special concurrent city council and HRA work session of May 12th, 2015, and the regular city council meeting of May 12th, 2015. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Tonight, of course, you heard those lovely loud voices. We have a choir concert presentation um, with the STEM and the RDLS fifth graders, and I'm sure I'm going to turn it over to their teachers. Good evening, and thank you for coming tonight. This is our combined Richfield Dual Language and Richfield STEM School Choir of fifth graders. We meet once a week, week on Tuesdays. And we've been rehearsing since uh, January. We're going to do our big concert next week. We will present three numbers for you this evening. Our first selection will be America the Beautiful with hand sign and a counter melody. Our second selection is a folk song called Tumbai, which has only two words, Tumbai and Tra-La-La. <laughs> our last selection has more words. It is Follow the Drinking Gourd, and it is an African-American code song from the Civil War period. Would you please prior. introduce yourself? I am Kathy Luby. I am the music teacher at RDLS, and this is Mrs. Gail Miles, who is the music teacher at STEM. Wonderful. We do this choir together.
This has to be the highlight of the city of Ridgefield to have you come here every year. You coming back next year, right? <laughs> all right. I, I love it. You guys are incredibly good. I hope you all keep singing. We love it. We love it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Well, that was the, the STEM school and the RDLS. I just want to say, you know, our schools are incredibly cool. And this is some of the talent that you see right here. I mean, think about some of the highlights. They're singing different songs at different times, and, and, and it's just gorgeous. And their voices, you can understand every word. Uh, thanks to the great teachers that we have over at these schools. It was just fabulous. Just fabulous. Comments? Well, who's got to follow that? I know. <laughs> well, unfortunately, um, I feel really sorry because it's actually the comprehensive financial report. <laughs> I'm sure you're all going to want to stay for that. <laughs> oh, they're all. Right? Yeah. It'll be delivered in song. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. That we could do. Yes. Well, they deliver it in song. I don't know. It's a good idea. So we'll give you a couple of minutes to clear out and then we'll move on. So they really don't come for us? They don't really come for us? No, I think they, they really. <laughs> I know, the room was packed. There was standing room only. I'm really surprised they're not staying for the comprehensive financial, financial report. Yeah, I, I think city manager did that on purpose so I'd clear the room. The <laughs> <laughs> Next year we'll have to have a juggling act or something. Mm -hmm. yeah, Got to have entertainment. Yes, entertainment. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so... Looks, it looks like the doors are closing and it's quieting down. And this is a presentation, the receipt of the City Ridgefield Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2014. And we got a whole bunch of information on this already. So uh, we'll open it up. Please introduce yourself to the city. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Members of the Council, appreciate the invitation. I'm Matt Mayor, representing the city's audit firm of uh, KDV. I'm here tonight to present the results of the annual financial audit in the context of the comprehensive annual financial report. You receive the documents ahead of time, and I just want to give a very brief overview of the results yep. of our mm -hmm. audit and the financial uh, position and activity for the city for the year. Spend about five minutes or so, and if there's any questions at the end, be happy to take those on. Our role as auditors is this. The city has a responsibility to prepare financial statements for the public each year to show the results of operations, its financial position at the end of each year. And I think now is a good time to thank Chris Regis, the city's finance director, and his team. They were very well prepared for this year's audit. It went very smoothly and very helpful throughout the entire process. Our job as auditors is to come in at the end of the year, test, examine, give an opinion on those statements so that users of them can be assured of their accuracy. We do that through our independent auditor's report, which you'll find in front of the financial statements, and we're providing an unmodified or clean opinion, which is the best we can give you. It means that the numbers we're going to be looking at are accurate. They're a true picture of the city's financial position at the end of the last fiscal year. Now, because the city receives significant federal dollars, the federal government requires that we do a compliance audit on the significant programs that you have. Your most significant program here at Richfield, of course, is the Section 8 housing, and as a result, we test that one almost annually. And again, looking for things to make sure that you're in compliant with the grants there, that you're following the rules associated with the dollars that you're receiving, and again, they're happy to provide an unmodified opinion on that. No findings there either. And then the final report I have to offer tonight is a Minnesota Legal Compliance Report. The state auditor requires that we make sure that you're complying with all the state statutes that apply to cities, making sure you're doing your contracting and bidding on the up and up, making sure there's no conflicts of interest here at the city. And again there, no findings at all. So I'm giving you three reports tonight. All three are the best that I can provide. So obviously I think the audit went very smoothly for the city for 24. Yeah, that's very nice. Mm -hmm. To the credit of the city, thank you. Very much. Comments or considerations? I'll move the report. Second. Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 I just want to thank um, Chris Regis, who is here, for uh, you had a lot to do with your staff for a clean report. You have anything you want to talk about it? Talk about your staff. You guys do a great job. It, well, we've all been doing it for 20 years now, so we've got it down hopefully <laughs> to a science and things like that. I mean, there are hiccups along the way and things like that, but. Uh, I couldn't do it without my staff and things like that. They all contribute and everything. So, yeah, it's always nice to have a. And it's and I like to give credit to Matt and his staff too. They're very very good to work with. I mean, they let me know what they need and they, they, they very. If I stumble somewhere along the way, they're there there to uh, pick me up and help me along and stuff like that too. So he's got a very very good staff and I really enjoy working with him and, and his staff. 
Mayor, I don't want to leave Steve Devich out of this because he had to make some hard decisions back in 2008 when we were cutting employees and that. And uh, it, it did pay off, and we're seeing that we're on the other side of the curve now. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yeah, hard decisions sometimes. Mm -hmm. I realize that. Thank you. Thank All you right. for thank coming you. and presenting mm -hmm. tonight. We appreciate that. Ma Madam Mayor, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, oftentimes this stuff is just really technical and dry and boring. But, you know, it, I think uh, there's been so much improvement lately in terms of making it understandable. So, and I think that has a lot to do with the transparency issue, too, because it promotes, it promotes clear, concise information. Okay, that, that's a great comment. You're absolutely right. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have the annual meeting with the Advisory Board of Health. Hi, I'm Erin Rickon. I'm the chair of the Advisory Board of Health. We, I think you guys all received this in your packet. Yep, yep, we so we put together our annual report for 2014 <laughs> with to highlight some of the exciting events and other uh, boards or programs that we're involved with, so that way we can bring the knowledge back into uh, Richfield that extends out to Bloomington and Edina, and that we were able to touch more than just a few items when we send out board members. We can get a big grasp of what's happening in our community. Um, so highlighted here are just a few of the things that we have done this year or a few of the programs that we've been involved in. Um, PenFest this year, we splurged and got a banner for our table, so that way people knew who we were. Uh, we also had literature this year that we were able to provide for people that had uh, questions regarding what our role was in the community. Another exciting thing that we started too, which is not in here, um, is safe routes to school. There were many students that um, walked to school and were missing certain signage. Um, and so a parent uh, coalition has been started and a Facebook page to try to get, um, I guess, a, a plan on how to attack that situation. And so that's something that ended, started at the end of last year. So it wasn't really involved enough to be put into this report. But next year it'll be in here with more detail. I want to thank you, though, for getting the uh, Wellness Expo going because mm -hmm. I was there again this year, and it's even it get just keeps growing. And yeah, I couldn't even get in to get my cholesterol check there because there's so many people waiting in line. <laughs> Everybody decided to come. It was wonderful. Yeah, every year it's been growing, and then all of us board members buy items and uh, donate them for the drawings or for when people come in or to be raffled off for them. And so the board did a great job of coming together and everybody providing items for that and. Mm -hmm. And so there's lots of things that we're giving out, footballs to uh, kites to hula hoops to soccer balls. So it was really nice that we were able to come together and, and provide those items to make the expo bigger and better than it has been the last few years. So, And I like the fact that the prizes are something that get the kids active. Yes. Get them out, right? Yes. Get them out to do something. Yeah. That's Not video fun. games. <laughs> and and um, we got chip dollars again. So yes, so yes, which we were a little money. nervous about yeah. with the ship dollars yeah. the last few weeks. We've been crossing our fingers since it was zeroed out, but luckily matched. I believe it ended up matching the the uh, years before. So, okay. we ended up getting so we'll be able to continue with all the programming that we're doing now. Mm -hmm. And explain the ship dollars, what they are. Um, it's the statewide state health improvement program, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Is that it, the program? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it goes to sustainable activities um, or sustainable programs. So they're not going to provide funding for something that has to, they have to keep providing funding. But for a thing for like Veep, they at the farmer's market were able to provide funds for cans to collect people's um, garden, you know, food that they don't use. So if they had too many tomatoes, they can bring it down to the farmer's market and drop it in these Veep bins. So that's an idea of what they give money to. They also give grant money um, to help with healthy eating, to exercise, breastfeeding, all s I mean, all sorts of health-related uh, items that they're able to give money to either get uh, 
programs or literature made um, that can be used year after year um, without needing to tap into more and more funds to get it passed. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very exciting to see new programs. And mm -hmm. this year we rewarded mini grants. Um, and that was fun. I was on the committee to uh, pick who received those mini grants. And so it was amazing to see all sorts of ideas that came through to um, providing meals to senior citizens for during the winter when they can't get out <laughs> if it's a snow day. So that way they have a backup meal that they can have frozen and, and things like that. So yeah, no, SHIP is amazing. It does amazing work and touches tons of aspects in our community. Mm -hmm. So it's nice that it was there. And that's your state tax dollars helping a lot of people right here in our own community. It pays back. So yeah. thank you. I think you guys do an amazing job. You know, um, I think this is just a, a, a great commission. Um, and I'm happy to be the liaison because I think you do great work there, near and dear to my heart. So I really appreciate that. And um, you might as well stay right up there because the presentation of the 2014 Food Awards are the are the very next thing. And that's something yes. that the Board of Health does as well. So you want to explain that? Yes. So every year, this started in 2006, um, the Advisory Board of Health decided that we would rather nominate and give the spotlight to restaurants um, that did an amazing job versus, you know, the restaurants that failed um, checks and things like that. Because it's important to recognize when people actually do something right mm -hmm. and well. Um, and so thanks to our food um, inspector, Jessica Yutz, for going out um, and checking um, all the different restaurants. And we have it in two categories. We have large full service restaurants and then we have fast food mm -hmm. uh, restaurants. And then after that, when she comes up with her list um, and her inspections, there is a Bloomington Food Collaborator group that goes out um, and then they look at the restaurants for service and for other items um, in there. The two scores are compiled, and then the Advisory Board of Health gets three to four names issued to them that were the top scorers. And the Advisory Board of Health then goes through and nominates uh, two to three out of them and picks the winner out of those. So this year, um, we have two uh, new winners. I don't think they've ever won before, so we're really excited about that. Um, our first one we have for Cardio Express. Um, and they are off of Penn, and I can tell you their pho is amazing. <laughs> My husband gets it all the time. Mm -hmm. Do you want to come up here to present to you guys with your award? They won for the full service restaurant um, area. Here he comes to you. <laughs> Get the photo up. Yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. We have to get the photo because we send it to the newspaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that way they get even more press. Mm -hmm. So and then for our fast food, we have Taco Bell um, that is over um, off of, if I remember the address, off of 2nd Avenue. And then for our nominees or our runner-ups that we have, we had for the full service restaurants, we had Devani's Incorporated off of Penn and then also Sandy's Tavern off of Penn. They were also nominated. And then Dairy Queen uh, Grill and Chill. And that one is um, off of the 66th Street. West um, and they were West 66. West 66, yep. Yeah. Um, and they were also nominated as well. And Arby's. So. And Arby's, yep. Arby's was also, and Arby's, I believe, won last year. So mm -hmm. it's nice to see new people stepping up and taking this serious mm -hmm. and being able to provide them with something that they can be proud of and hang on the wall in their establishment. So thank you to our winners this yes, year. Yes, yes. I just, I just want to thank everybody for setting a really good example. I know that the restaurant business, it's really hard to do that. So even those who were nominated and didn't win, thank you, because that also sets a precedence and puts the pressure on the other ones who aren't complying so well. So thank you for working so hard at keeping your restaurants clean, neat, and providing really fabulous food. So I know Edwina likes to go out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I always make myself available if anyone wants to buy me lunch. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I want to thank you for this report. I think you're the only commission that actually puts a report like this together. We like to step up and go above and beyond. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and it's, it really is laid out well. Thank you. It's very attractive and it, it really specifies what you've been working on, so we appreciate that. 
And the other thing I wanted to thank you for is for co-sponsoring that uh, Children's Mental Health Forum. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was very, very successful. We, we certainly got a lot of good comments. And it's important, I think, for the League of Women Voters or, or the community organizations or agencies to have um, a relationship with, you know, the League of Women Voters or whatever. And after after we did, you know, the, the mental health one, the Human Rights and um, Commission and the League of Women Voters also did one on human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So all of that just uh, highlights you know, what, what great folks we have that volunteer and care about our community. Yeah, and I think the mental illness one mm -hmm. was well well done. Yes. Um, and I think s putting a spotlight on mental illness um, is very important, especially for our youth. Yes. I think it's hard for them to come forward to say, I have this, and therefore it's hidden and, and pushed aside, and then they get lost in the system. So it was very well I think received and, and obviously mm -hmm. very important to our youth that that happens. And then I appreciate it to the uh, members of the advisory board of health who came to the forum. And that's a, that's a, a big support there. Yeah, yeah. I think we had think three or four people. I think you had four. Was it four? Yeah, mm -hmm. I couldn't remember. So almost half. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it was good. Good. Yeah. Very wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for volunteering and thank you for all the mm -hmm. great things you do for our community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, next we have the presentation of the Richfield Tourism Promotional Board, the financial report for the year ending December 31st, 2014 and 2013. Hello, Mayor and Council. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to present this tonight. My name is Pat Brecken, uh, President of RBCU, and here representing the Richfield Tourism Promotion Board. So hopefully included in your packet was the audit that was completed by Lafayette, Melson, and Plath uh, back in March of this year. And you'll find no audit findings that, uh, that they noted. And I just thought I'd take a couple seconds and give you a quick update on how the last couple of years have gone for tourism. Um, you'll notice in the report 2014, mm -hmm the tax revenues uh, collected by the hotel properties was up significantly. A lot of that's just due to the fact in 2012, 2013, there was a lot of renovations going on mm. at, uh, at the two largest hotel properties. Those were completed and you can see that the, the numbers are starting to go back in the right direction for us and for them. Mm -hmm. um, in 2013, and then you'll see a significant increase in spending on website design and web uh, e-marketing in 2014, the, the committee and the, or the board decided to spend more, t more money on the e-marketing of Richfield. So we, we spent significant dollars on upgrading the tourism website. So if you get a chance to go out and, and do the, uh, look at the Visit Richfield website, you'll see some, some neat improvements over a couple years ago. And uh, we're spending more money on Google AdWords and some different things to as people are looking for places to stay and places to eat and visit, mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to get the, the Visit Richfield site and the hotel properties more prominent. Um, so a significant, there's been significant web traffic increase over the previous years. I think uh, one of our most recent meetings, there was over 4,000 visits to the website in one given month, which wow. was amazing. That is good. Um, so we've, and we're working with a local company, Richfield Company, Minnesota Interactive, and Dan Randolph and his group have really helped uh, both the chamber and Visit Richfield improve its web presence. And then we did, we have continued to uh, invest in traditional advertising using the advertising firm Neiman Feeder. We've worked with them for many, many years. And last year they uh, created some TV ads that uh, were run up in Duluth area, trying to promote people from Northern Minnesota to come down. We continue to work with the Explore Minnesota uh, advertising campaigns and are able to, in that in that campaign, promote Richfield's bike-friendly community. Oh. So all of the work that Richfield has done over the years with the bike trails and some of the different road improvements, um, bike paths, we're, we're trying to promote that through some of the Explore Minnesota um, options that we have. And then finally, we spent some time, and I think a few of you might have been involved last year with some brand, uh, a brand study. So we were looking at maybe uh, doing some, some 
revamping of all the different logos from the city to the chamber to the Visit Richfield. Uh, nothing at this point has come of that other than, uh, for me, I think one of the, the best things that we did was a focus group. And it really solidified for me, which all of us in this room know, the inner workings of Richfield are, it's a great, wonderful, quaint, small community. And it was interesting to hear others that didn't grow up in Richfield or haven't lived in Richfield for a long time, hear what their perception was prior to moving to Richfield and what their perception is now. And when you see the exterior of Richfield, as they said, you know, it looks at it, it apartment buildings and businesses and all of that. And you get about three blocks in, basically on any of our borders, and it's a whole different community. So um, again, that gem of Richfield still exists, and it was nice to hear people in that focus group talk about that. And so as part of our promotion of Richfield, those are some of the things that we've taken from this year to continue to focus on as we move forward. So that's, uh, that's some of the things that we've been working on. Uh, I'll stand for any questions if you have any. Just a comment. I'm glad to hear that we're promoting up in Duluth. I see a lot of ads down here for Duluth, so I'm glad <laughs> we're going up to Duluth and promoting up to them. Come down to where it's, it's warmer. Right, there you go. I <laughs> there spent some go. of my coldest summers up there in Duluth. <laughs> so it, it's exactly. uh, come down here for the warmth, right? No, thanks for the hard work that you do. And it's nice to hear a clean audit, too. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you. Hmm? Do we need to move for an acceptance of this? I believe so. Yeah, you, you, yeah. you could do that. I move acceptance hurt. of the report. Yeah. Second. Manager. Any other discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Now we have a, a really special presentation of the Association of Public Managers Management Professionals Assistant of the Year Award to the Richfield Assistant City Manager and HR Manager, Pam Dimitrenko. Now she's already received this, but she's going to come up and show her award, and I'm going to read what they said. So I have a thing down here. This is actually a pretty big deal, I mean, when they go through all this and everything and everything. So um, talk about all you had to do and how you got that beautiful award. Thank you for the recognition. I, I really appreciate the council recognizing this, and I was really honored and appreciative to get the recognition from my peers because in, in this line of work, you really need support of your colleagues. And um, I really felt that. And at the conference when I was presented with the award, um, they, they kindly talked about many accomplishments, um, highlights here so far of my almost 16 years at Richfield. And, but it really made me think about, for example, like this building, the project management of this building. But I think this award really also signifies a team effort because, um, you know, that takes the work of my, my coworkers, uh, community members to accomplish these things. And, and of course, the support of council and a wonderful mentor, uh, Steve Davitt. So. Thank I you. just want to read the announcement that went out, and it's at this year's annual Minnesota City and County Managers Association Conference, which, which was held May 13th through the 15th. Our city assistant manager, HR manager, Pam Dimitrenko, was honored with the APMP Assistant of the Year Award. APMP is the Association of Public Management Professionals. The award is in recognition by her peers for the exemplifying the best in the local government management profession in our state. So thank you. Thanks. Congratulations. <laughs> you know, that's one thing I've got to say for uh, Richfield City staff, you know, they're really outstanding and, and it's good that, that uh, Mr. Devich surrounded himself with so much knowledge and talent because he really needs a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> we, how did we know that was coming? How did we know that was coming? I, I don't want to belittle the, the efforts the city council and the mayor put in, but, but we, this, the people up here change. The people on staff don't, and I think that's why that's the heart of the city. And, and we make the decisions, but all the information that's given to us and all the work that goes into the decisions we make falls 100% on the staff. And I think that's why the, the mayor and the city councils throughout the years have been successful. It's not, it's, not, it's not exactly what they do. They make the decisions, but they get so much help and so much support and so much information that it's almost impossible to go wrong. That's just my perspective. So, mm -hmm. Thank you. 
Councilman? Uh, Steve, I think we need a bigger trophy case. Yeah, a yeah. <laughs> yeah, lot, lot of awards here, it's great. Um, with that, actually, we're gonna move to the council discussion, but I'm gonna actually open it up first to um, council member Fitzhenry. He's got a report from the MAC, and I wanted him to give that. That's very important information. So would you please? Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I put on your desk uh, something that we almost fell out of our chairs on in the MAC. Uh, the FAA uh, did a press release uh, to reevaluate the method of measuring effects of aircraft noise. This is the first time we've ever seen, or anybody's ever seen, involved in noise where the FAA is actually coming out and saying they're going to go look at the effects of noise into the communities. And it's going to be beginning in the next two or three months, the FAA will contact residents around selected U.S. airports uh, through the mail, telephone, to survey public perceptions of aviation noise throughout the course of the year. Uh, this will be the most comprehensive study using a single noise survey ever undertaken in the United States. Uh, polling communities surrounding 20 airports nationwide, um, and this is to, uh, preserve, uh, to preserve the scientific integrity, they're not letting us know who the airports are. So it's gonna happen, they're just gonna do it, and I kinda get where they're coming from, they don't want anybody kinda padding the, the scale in that. And what will happen is about the end of 2016, they will come up with the results. And based on that, uh, they'll decide how they evaluate sound, and they'll use the methodology mm -hmm. to uh, see if they need to change the FAA's current approach, as well as consideration of compatible land uses and justification for federal expenditures for areas that are not compatible with airport noise. I'm not sure if this means dollars will be available <laughs> to the cities or what's happening. I think in Richfield, we've already done that with our noise uh, type zoning and that. Uh, but what will be important is where that DNL level comes at. Uh, it's traditionally been set at 65. Uh, we'll see if they lower it to 60. There was a lot of talk of that. So it'll be... Uh, like I said, the first study, I think they're going to get an eye opening on what they get back from residents. And the, probably the first time they'll ever get, they've ever gotten feedback from the people that live around the airport. So we'll be really interested in seeing what comes up with that uh, and where they go with that uh, noise level and how they change the measurements. So. Uh, Council Member, one of the questions I guess I would have too is I'm hoping that when they look at the different airports, they'll look at some where RNAV has been implemented. Because my understanding, at least from the last conference mm -hmm. and I shared with you, is that it's it's not necessarily louder noise, but it's a lot more flights can take off, so it's still perceived as more. So it's a really different Yeah, I, 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 I'm sure with <laughs> if they pick Atlanta, there are a few airports that already have implemented RNAV, so uh, let's hope. Otherwise, we'll look at that when it comes out. Arizona. And ask them. Yeah, one, and yeah. see what's, what's happening. Yeah. Also, we had a, uh, uh, Jeff Hamill, uh, the uh, airport commission, come and talk to us and kind of give us his overview of what's happening with the MAC. Uh, of course, the biggest thing is Sun Country. What's going on with Sun Country? Are they going to stay in business or not? And uh, whether they're going to expand uh, the uh, terminals for more gates. So that's all dependent on what happens mm -hmm. to Sun Country. The good news is uh, the airport uh, has decided they don't need any more runways. <laughs> they got as many runways as they need and can handle things. Uh, the trend is still to see uh, more people go on less flights uh, or the upscaling of aircraft. And uh, we heard, if I get it right, is it the NEO engine that they were talking about? 25% uh, less noisy. Uh, there's an incentive for the airliners to go to it too because there's an efficiency on that. And one good thing about Delta, uh, we were kind of scared about when they first took over Northwest. They've been good partners. They keep us well informed. Uh, this is probably their most profitable market. And so they do not want to mess with Minnesota. And they've been uh, looking at upscaling their aircraft because they're so big. They can afford the changes in aircraft where the little carriers can't. Yeah. So what will happen is Delta will sell their planes to somebody else. Um, the other thing that was really interesting, I'm going to reiterate it, uh, is that the MAC is totally funded by users. Uh, a lot of people don't realize there's not any tax dollars 
going in the MAC. They haven't uh, taxed anybody since 1969, and they don't intend to. So they all the users, meaning air cargo, the people that buy tickets and that at the MAC pay for the MAC. And they've been so far a good steward of keeping that money there and using it properly. And when you see what they do and all they try to do with the money they got, it's kind of nice. But they have the authority to tax, and we've never seen that, and let's hope we never see that. <laughs> and uh, so the report sounded good. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything. I don't know if Pam's got anything we need to add. But that was kind of it. And so w w this made us fall off our chairs. We're really interested to see what the FAA is going to do. And the first time they've ever really put out there that they're going to actually look at what's happening in the community. So That's this wonderful. is a huge step for the FAA. Yeah. Steve, did you have something to add? Yeah. Uh, first of all, yeah, I was at that meeting. You, I think you covered exactly uh, the main ish, uh, topics that were there. The w I just wanted to add on to something you said, Tom, and that is if anybody gets the opportunity, go to YouTube and pull up uh, the new Neo engine, yeah. and, they'll, and they can show you comparisons. Uh, I know Airbus is looking at they've got a Neo engine. Uh, Boeing's got a Neo engine. But listen to the difference okay. on those Neo engines uh, on, on the sound profile as compared to the planes that are flying today. It's it's astounding, wow. the difference. It's not quieter, wow. Yep. That, that's wonderful. Council uh, Member? I just wanted to, to also um, mention that Pam Dimitrenko is the staff person that uh, this is in, on her plate. And she's got, um, and I don't think really folks know exactly what she does, <laughs> but she often heads the probably one of the you know, projects that um, that really require a lot of time and effort and, and I mean, you just have always been there and do your darnest to, you know, accumulate the information you need to and, and make sure that, you know, that the city, it benefits the city. So uh, I appreciate that. And, uh, and then the other thing I was going to ask, I don't know if you or, or, Fitz or Council Member Fitzhendry, do you know how much the passenger facilities charge is per head? It was, I, I have the notes here and I have to look it up, but they did give it what it is per. Uh, when what, when what I was in the house, it was $3. No, it's it's up to it was like five something plus, because okay. okay. I, I have it in the notes, but they he did, okay. it's up, oh, it's more than $3, I think. Right. <laughs> with inflation now, so at the, was it 587 ring a bell to me? Something like that. Closer to six dollars, yeah. and and as far as uh, other airports, we're actually uh, Mac does a better job of getting passengers through cheaper for the airlines than most other airports, which is really interesting because other airports like Denver and that are supported by cities, and Mac does not use taxes, so uh, they got some sort of magic where they can turn them dollars in and make it profitable for the airliners. So. But there are some airports across the country that use the passenger facilities charge that goes directly to noise mitigation. Mm. And, uh, and Mac did that when they were for forced to, but uh, I don't know what, I don't know what, um, where it goes. Well, now. we're unusual because we have that court ruling that, yeah. <laughs> that came through, so we're bound by that in the air too. So it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of like they, I think they've settled most of it and we're really done with most of it unless they change the actual, pr you know, uh, profile of the flights and we redo that and it'll be interesting if the FAA comes up with a new way to measure that that is going to change a lot of things so well we'll I'm see what happens I'm so. glad we're back in the noise group because I think yeah. they're going to have a big influence on what comes out of this too so uh, thank the city and for your recommendation yes. Tom, on that so I think that's a good idea okay um, we have some other item of business on council discussion is uh, canceling of the August 25th regular city council meeting and scheduling the Monday, August 24th, spe Special City Council regarding the 2015-2016 proposed budget and, and discussion with the city manager. Uh, the 24th is best for all the staff that would be providing the information for us. So, because, of course, it's vacation time, and so we want to make sure that everybody's there. Um, the other thing is, is we could look at canceling the 25th, or we could look at the other uh, council meeting. We usually cancel one meeting. We could do the 11th as well. I'm just wondering what ca what council would prefer. Um, I mean, we're really not losing a meeting so much when we have them back to back like this. When we cancel one and have it the Monday before, I don't know what people's schedules are for the. Well, 
Well, for me, the uh, the way it's posted here, uh, August 25th is fine with the 24th being a special council meeting. I mean, we still yeah. be having one in August. I just yeah. don't know what people's vacations are like. I'm pretty indifferent. He's he's. Are you, doesn't matter. Are you guys okay with this the way it is? Sure. Okay, move it the way it is. Okay, just checking in. So just to make sure I understand, we're, we're going to have the budget meeting on the 24th and mm -hmm. we're going to cancel the, the council 25th. meeting on the 25th. So mm -hmm. you'll end up with two council meetings in the month of we August, but, uh, in but August. instead of three. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's okay. okay. Yep. I think we're all okay with that. Okay. Um, okay, council discussion and hats off to hometown hits. Edwina, I know you got your list. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, it's, it's really kind of a short list. Okay. But uh, first I wanted to mention uh, um, the fact that former um, mayor and city council member uh, Don Preby passed away last week. And uh, I wanted to, to mention some of the things that he accomplished while he was um, mayor and council member. Uh, one of the things that we did not do before is stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance. So he's the one that um, initiated that. The other thing he did is, um, this was before it became, you know, now everyone does it, but he was, uh, he did the open mic at the beginning and closing of the meetings. Um, he also, uh, you know, the HRA used to be five council members and he decided and, and, and uh, discussed it with the council and they came up with two council members for the HRA and three citizens. And so that's, that's um, worked out well. I, I think he put like Mike Freeman and Tom Harms and uh, Joan uh, Helmberger. So they, they stayed on that and they did a marvelous job. Um, the other thing, he was very instrumental too in the 4th of July parade and making sure that happened. Uh, but one of the things that um, Mr. Devich reminded me of is that, you know, he's the one that really sought and worked for uh, Rich Acres Golf Course. And that golf course really, uh, you know, I, th I think did an awful lot for Richfield and it brought us um, some attention and notoriety. So that's, um, that's Don Preby. And, s and uh, we have a lot, of, a lot of good citizens that do a lot for Richfield and just wanted to honor his memory. Okay, now here's the start. The, the memorial ceremony, which was um, done was it Monday? Monday, that was really, really quite good. I mean, the weather I think was perfect and um, the band was beautiful as always. And we had our uh, police chief, Jay Henthorne, he spoke. And he spoke about uh, Fred Babcock. And I, and I think he laid out, you know, the history and the facts. And uh, did a good job of doing that because uh, Floyd Roman followed him after that. And Floyd was able to fill in the personal side of that uh, shooting and killing of our police officer. And uh, I, I just think it really, y you both did an outstanding job. And, uh, and you know, y I, that's one thing, you always learn something when you go to these memorial ceremonies. So I appreciate that. Okay, here we go. Uh, the 4th of July uh, committee is going to sponsor a silent auction on um, May the 31st, which is a Sunday from 3 to 8 p.m. and it will be held at the American Legion. So if you get a chance, please stop by and pick up some, some good stuff. Uh, the other thing is the farmer's market is now open. So hopefully we can frequent that too. And then the Flex Academy will have um, its final um, informational session, which is done at Wood Lake Nature Center. Uh, and that'll be May the 28th. And that invites parents and students, potential students, to um, find out exactly what how Flex Academy works and what it does. And, um, and it's gonna be, uh, I think, very, another asset to Richfield because we do have a number of um, learning uh, whether it's, you know, whether it's um, schools or, or like that Minnesota Life College and, you know, so that's, that's really um, good. 
um, they will be also be having their open house on June the 18th, and I'll let you know more about that later. And then we've got June the 4th, Entertainment in the Park, and that starts the, um, the band series, and it'll be the Richfield Symphony Band, and, that, uh, and then uh, that's June the 4th, and June the following one will be the um, Richfield High School Band that will perform. There'll also be another kids' entertainment in the park at Augsburg Park again in June the 9th, and it'll be uh, from 12 noon. It will start with a, with a meal, and, uh, and it'll follow every, it'll be on every Tuesday until July the 28th, and that's um, something really fun for the kids. Keeps them entertained, it keeps them fed, and uh, it, and, you know, it brings uh, the use of our parks and recreation together in a, in a very solid way. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Council Member Elliott, do you want to follow That's that? That's it, she says. I mean, <laughs> I'd, I'd rather foul the dual language STEM school choir. <laughs> You set me up every time, Edwin. Oh, um, the only thing I want to say is, is on Memorial Day, I've got commitments in the afternoon that don't allow me to attend the ceremony here, but um, every year I go over there early. And I said it last year, and I'll say the same thing. It is a wonderful place to go and reflect. doesn't necessarily have to be a military. It's lost ones, just what Memorial Day means. And, and I find it a very peaceful setting. I was over there about 11 till about noon and you just wander around, you look at the names. Um, I know a lot of them and, and I know a lot of them of my generation that died in Vietnam. And, and so it, 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 it brings a, a sense of reality to, to what we are and what we're about and what we've given to, to maintain that. And I think more importantly, I think we're a testament to what Memorial Day is all about on how we handle our celebration the, uh, and the honor, the true meaning of Memorial Day. And it's not about having a picnic or anything. You may do that before, you may do that after. But the ceremony is what it's all about, and I think it's a testament to Richfield that we do it every year, and we do it really well. Yeah. Council Member Howard. Uh, I, I wanted to mention Memorial Day as well, and just thank the people of Richfield uh, for uh, attending it in uh, honoring our those that we've lost and I just was so impressed with the number of people that were there and you know we have the chance to recognize uh, members uh, of each you know the army and marines and, and folks stand up and uh, for those folks to get to see a community of you know well over 100 people there uh, uh, over over 500 people there uh, uh, it just just shows you uh, in this community uh, how, how important uh, that is to our, our history, and uh, it was just, uh, I think reflective is the right word, uh, and the exact right tone and opportunity for everyone to, to think about those close to them and uh, that we've lost, and so uh, it's an excellent, excellent uh, tribute and one that obviously will continue. Council Member Pacone. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and I want to apologize for missing the first part of it. I had an event pop up that I... Uh, I wanted to be there so bad, you always <laughs> and I, I was racing back on my motorcycle to try to make it, and I got toward the end. But I want to acknowledge the uh, two police unions that went ahead and donated the funds for having Fred Babcock's name engraved on the uh, tablet. Yeah. Uh, I think they need to be recognized, and one thing you'll find in the cop community, cops take care of cops, as you know we've seen with all the funerals and that. So I wanted to mention them, and thank you for doing that. And also I wanted to mention that she mentioned Don Preby. He was the one that started the mm -hmm. noise against the airport type uh, <laughs> path. And so uh, we got to acknowledge him as the one that really started going after the airport and telling them we don't need the noise in our communities. So. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent. Well, then I have a follow-up to Please. that. <laughs> uh -oh. Another joke. Well, Don Preby and um, uh, Mark Mann from the Bloomington City Council they put together, there's a SPAC group in South Minneapolis for airport uh, noise. Um, and Don and, and Mark put together one that was called BRAG. That's uh, Bloomington Richfield Airport Action Group. And uh, so that just reminded me. Okay. Thank you. 
And I just wanted to follow up on the uh, farmer's market that was, was there. They do have plants for sale, although we lost our big gardener. There's, there's quite a few people coming with plants down there. So if you're looking for herbs and you're looking for tomatoes and even some flowers and stuff like that, you can still go down to the farmer's market and get those. But I also wanted to know that, note that there's some new food vendors at Vena. Mm. And oh, I, I know you didn't join me for breakfast this week, but maybe next time. Um, they, they back at, at popular demand are the Moo Moo's. Oh my gosh, little golden nuggets there. They, they, they are pockets of um, meat uh, followed by a lovely dough. They're just wonderful. And then I've tried everything there. Uh, the samosas are really fabulous too from our own Paradise Bakery here. Um, they do two kinds of lentils and then meat. Both of those are extremely tasty. And then we have a Mediterranean vendor with gyros uh, coming out there too. So besides the fact that the breadsmith is back and has lovely breads and, and muffins and things like this. So if, if you're just coming down just to look around and gaze and you want to grab something just to sit around and talk with your neighbors, it's what I do a lot of, um, please come down to the farmer's market. And you'll see me there most, most Saturdays. Um, any other comments? I'll ask approval of the agenda as it Madam stands. Madam Mayor, before you please get off of the topic, please. can I just say that for those who, ha who missed uh, the Memorial Day, uh, well, it's certainly the speech by, mm -hmm. by the chief and by, um, by Floyd Roman, uh, that, was all, that was all filmed. Yep. And we're putting it on, we're going to put it on, there will be connections from our webpage, and I think we're going to put it on Channel 16. Oh, excellent. So people who missed it, mm -hmm. um, oh, wonderful. from what I hear, you, you need to watch it. Yep. Yeah, that Thank gets you. bigger every year. That's such a beautiful thing. I never miss it. Yeah. Approval of the agenda as it stands? So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, we have the consent calendar. City Manager. Thank you, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. The consent calendar for those in the audience contains several separate items, tonight only two, however, which are acted upon by the City Council in one motion. Once the consent calendar has been approved, the individual items and the recommended actions will also have been approved and then no further council action on those items is ne are necessary. So tonight we have two. Item A is consideration of the approval of resolution authorizing the city to affirm the monetary limits on statutory municipal tort liability. And item B, consideration of the approval of the setting of a public hearing to be held on June 23rd, 2015 for the consideration of the issuance of a new on-sale intoxicating liquor and Sunday license for GM Richfield LLC doing business as Four Points by Sheraton Minneapolis Airport, located at 7745 <coughs> Lindale Avenue South. And that concludes tonight's consent calendar. I'll move the calendar. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Um, next we have uh, item 11, um, Council Member Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this item involves a public hearing for the consideration of the issuance of new on-sale intoxicating liquor and Sunday licenses for Thompson's Fireside Pizza, Inc., DBA Fireside Pizza, located at 6736 Penn Avenue South. Um, on April 2nd, 2015, the city received the application materials for new on-sale intoxicating and Sunday liquor licenses for Thompson's, P Thompson's Fireside Pizza, Inc., DBA Fireside Pizza, located at 6736 Penn Avenue South. Thompson's Fireside Pizza, Inc. is owned by Rich Thompson, has been an established business in Richfield since 1996, and currently holds on-sale wine and 3.2% malt liquor licenses. Due to a remodeling project of the building's structure, owner Rich Thompson is requesting a change from his current license status to on-sale intoxicating liquor and Sunday licenses. A public safety background investigation was completed November 6, 2014, for the renewal of their currently held wine and 3.2% malt liquor licenses. The public safety director reviewed the renewal background investigation report and determined an additional public safety background was not needed for the applications of new on-sale intoxicating liquor and Sunday licenses at this time. All required information and documents have been received. A prorated fee for the duration of six months has been received. And I would just add that I believe public safety director has indicated he sees no or has no objections to the issuance of this license. That's a public hearing, Your Honor. So I'll open the public hearing. Would anyone like to come forward and speak? I know that the uh, owner is here. Would you like to say great things about when we might expect your restaurant to open? No. <laughs> I've been driving by it, and I can't wait to see the, the improvements and everything. This is a public hearing. Would anyone else like to come forward? Anyone? Move to close the hearing, Your Honor. Second. All those in favor of closing the public hearing? Answer aye. with aye. 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 
Motion carries. Council At this members? time, I would move to approve the issuance of a new on-sale intoxicating liquor and Sunday licenses for Thompson's Fireside Pizza, Inc., DBA Fireside Pizza, located at 6736 Penn Avenue South. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, item 12, uh, Council Member Garcia. Okay. This item is a consideration of a resolution regarding a request for a six month extension of land use approvals granted for 6330, 6400, and 6440 Lindell Avenue, otherwise known as Lindell Gardens. Uh, and here's the uh, summary. On March the 26th of 2013, the City Council approved the development plans for the Lindell Gardens project located at 6400 Lindell Avenue. Approved plans call for a development that would include a 151 unit apartment building, 9,000 square feet of retail space, 2,600 square feet of restaurant space, and outdoor activity areas that would coordinate with the construction of Lake Winds Food Co-op. City approvals expire after one year unless construction has begun and substantial work has been completed. Then on December the 10th, 2013, the City Council approved an amendment to the proposed project that would allow up to 7,000 square feet of restaurant space in the development. Th this approval extended the permit expiration deadline to December the 10th of 2014. Now, subsequently, on October the 14th, 2014, the Cornerstone Group, which is a developer, requested and was granted a six month extension of the land use approvals with an additional six month extension contingent upon substantial completion of the construction of the quasi public improvements and securing full project funding by June the 10th, 2015. The development is unable to meet the requirements which would allow staff to authorize the additional six month extension and is therefore requesting the City Council approve a six month extension uh, for the land use approval at this time. Staff is recommending that such an extension, that if such an extension is approved, that substantial completion shall be defined as receiving issuance of one or more building permits valued at total of 10, million dollars or more on or before the expiration date of December the 10th, 2015. And Madam Mayor, I think we do have someone here from Cornerstone Group that would wanna uh, speak. You. Yes, please, I'd like you to invite you up and to uh, talk about this. It's been a struggle, I'm sure. We'd like to hear about it. Hello, Mayor, members of the council. I'm Colleen Carey from the Cornerstone Group. And um, mostly I think I'm here with good news. I, I'm sure you would love it if I were under construction, but I do, um, I do have some good news for, for us. Um, but there, are, there really are two pieces to our request tonight, and I'm not sure, I, I know you're gonna do them separately, but I guess I need to talk about them sort of together. So um, the, uh, so I'll, I'll just say for a little bit of history, the, the reason that we struggled to get this project underway was because of two elements. One of them was the, um, extra town center improvements that we wanted to do that are not part of a typical project. And the second piece that made it more complicated was the um, incorporation of mixed income housing. So both market rate housing and affordable housing in the same project. So our project still includes the town center, the vision that we all came up with for what this project should include. Um, but what, what we've learned over the last number of years as we've worked on this is that the sources of financing for affordable housing and market rate housing are really very separate. They're siloed. We had hoped that we were gonna create some way to connect those sources of financing and to do a project that had both affordable housing and market rate housing in it, in one building. And um, we were told that it was gonna be a challenge, but it turns out that there just really are not the tools to create that kind of project right now. We worked with lots of nonprofit funders. I think I came back to you a couple of times with these ideas for different nonprofit foundations that wanted to help support us in this, but it turns out that the tools are not available yet to actually integrate a, a low-income housing tax credit finance project, which is a very specific thing. 
affordable housing and market rate housing. So there are ways that this gets done, but for the most part, it's done where all of the units are in a range of affordable, not some of them are very high end and some of them are very low. And so we, um, we, we would like to, to uh, not do the affordable housing component. The moment that we um, were willing to consider that, we identified an investor who, so the good news is we have an investor that would like to work with us to move forward on this project, which is the thing that's been holding us up. So we do have an investor and, and uh, a representative from that organization is here and he will be happy to talk to you and answer some questions. So what we're, what we're here to say is we're ready to get going now. We have our investor, we have a, a project that works for the investment community. We have a number of banks that are now, we, we had always in, intended to do a HUD finance project and we could still do that, but there are a number of other banks that are interested in, in providing the, um, the financing for us. And so we're working through that a little bit just to make sure we have the, the right combination. But the big obstacle has always been the equity investor. And we have we finally um, have come up with the, the right combination of a project with the right returns and the right vision that still meets the intent of what we talked about before in terms of creating a new town center for the city, having the concert stage and the pizza oven and the urban farm and the farmer's market and the kids' splash pad and all those kinds of elements that are um, an important part of this project are still a part of the project. The piece that we have to give up on is, is creating 20% of the units at 50% um, of median income. So that's where we are. There wasn't specifically anything in your approvals that would that demanded that we have affordable housing. I know that you felt that it was an important piece of the project and so did we. So that's why we spent the last couple of years trying to work out whether there might be an investment um, scenario that would allow that to happen. The piece that we think is, is still really important to maintain is are these public improvements that we've talked about. And so that's, uh, that's the, sort of the second piece of our request, which is that we got some um, funding. You helped us get it from the Metropolitan Council to build those um, improvements that we're talking about. So that's why they're not underway right now, because we want to change the scope of the project in this way to eliminate the affordable housing units and just have a market rate project. And we have to go back to the Met Council to ask them for their approval. And in order to do that, we need your approval. So the things that we're here to ask for tonight are an extension on our PUD to get us to December because we think that'll be an adequate amount of time to finish getting to a closing, pull our building permits and be ready to go again this year. And then the second request is that you would authorize staff to go back to the Met Council and say we, the city of Richfield would still like this project to have the public amenities that are built into it and we would like the funding to be available for the project despite the fact that there isn't affordable housing in it. So I would like to introduce our partner Greg Handrich from FIDUS and um, have him just say a few words about his involvement in the project and then I could come back up and answer questions if that would be okay. That'd be fine. So Greg Handrich from FIDUS, uh, our um, Code General Partner Equity Investor Group is here. And um, Greg, would you just like to come up and introduce yourself and talk to my friends here about <laughs> what took you so long to get here? <laughs> thank you, Colleen. Appreciate that. Uh, Mayor, council members, thanks for giving me a chance to just come up and introduce myself. Um, as Colleen said, uh, my name's Greg Handrich. I'm uh, one of the principals of FIDUS Capital Partners. We're a real estate and advisory uh, company based out of suburban Chicago. Uh, we are fairly familiar with uh, Minneapolis. We made a fairly large acquisition last fall. We bought a portfolio of over 400 apartment units uh, with a partner um, called CPM, who you might know based out of up Uptown. Uh, we're also in the process of uh, uh, developing another uh, project in Uptown with CPM, uh, and that just got underway a couple weeks ago. And as uh, Colleen mentioned, we, uh, we got introduced to Colleen and her team probably shortly after our acquisition in the fall uh, of those apartment projects, and really liked Colleen and her team. They, they very, uh, very much portrayed experience uh, the ability to communicate. We liked their level of detail. We talked to them specifically on Lindale Gardens. Uh, and uh, we looked through the pro forma and the numbers and 
quite honestly came to the conclusion we loved the team, we loved the project, we loved the vision. It just didn't work with uh, us and our investors in terms of what we looked for in returns. And so we continued other discussions about other projects. Um, and then, uh, you know, a few months after that, got a call back from Colleen and her team that there was a way to make this project uh, be developed without, uh, you know, affordable housing. And at that point, we became interested because, again, um, uh, it's all about yield in our, our business and our investors, and, and now it made sense. And we, uh, we really liked the vision uh, and the, the idea of this site. In, you know, we, we tend to look for partners that, you know, are not just doing a deal, but they're doing a deal that has more to it than that. And clearly this, this site has uh, the ability to kind of transform the community, create a focal point for the community. And we think that creates a lot of value, not only for our, our investor and our team, but also for the community. And we think, you know, those sort of projects make a lot of sense. Um, and so, we, we'd love uh, to continue to, to move forward and get this thing closed. We think the time frame that has been outlined by her team is very achievable. Uh, and, you know, we're here tonight to answer any questions and, and try to get this thing uh, underway. Um, yeah, Colleen, I'd, I'd, if you have a timeline outline, would you share that with us? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, we, um, we have a number of things that we need to do to get t from here to construction, but primarily it's to finish some construction drawings and um, to do a bit of redesign to accommodate the kinds of changes that have happened in terms of the number of units and the size of the units and different design changes that all are within the, the existing idea, but we need to finish, uh, finish our construction drawings. We need to sign a construction contract. We need to pull building permits. We need to secure the construction loan. We have a number of, in, of construction lenders who are now interested because they also understand this is a project everybody understands now. It's a market rate apartment complex and it has these public amenities that are really important but they aren't as complicated for those investors and lenders as the affordable housing was. So we've outlined a schedule that we think gets us to a closing by November. So the December um, um, PUD extension would give us enough a little bit of cushion to get to a closing. And so tell us about the change in number of units. Um, so we would like to, um, within the, the building footprint that we have, create 157 units of, of um, housing instead of 151. We wouldn't change the footprint. We'd meet the same kinds of parking requirements that we've always had, which would actually mean we need to expand the underground parking a little bit further. So. Um, the, other, the other element of this is that we think we would come back one more time, uh, but we're telling you now that we think we would need to come back to, um, to, come to, to get an approval of a slightly different building plan that would have 157 units in the same footprint, but that would expand the parking so that we could accommodate 157 market rate units. When we, some of the units were affordable, they were going to have very low rent point and they were going to have surface parking. And now that they're all market rate units, we need more underground parking. So the building would be the same size that you've seen, the site plan wouldn't change. There'd be more units in that building and it would um, need a few more parking spaces underground. What about all the amenities? Are they gonna be the same? And what about the retail on the backside of Lakeland? Cause that's unfinished, restaurant, all the other things we've heard about. This, this particular investment group and, and many of the others that we talked to were not, are primarily housing or, or retail, they're not both. And so we're gonna separate those two projects out and have the retail pad will still be there. We can still do this 9,000 square foot retail pad on the backside of Lake Winds, but it isn't a part of the work that we would do with Fidus and that we would start now. The other amenities would stay the same. So um, I'm not sure which ones you're talking about. I was describing earlier the ones, the Met Council funded yep. pro amenities, the concert stage, the pizza oven, urban farm, splash pad, farmer's market, the bus shelter at the, the new bus shelter up at the front entrance, uh, all of those things would continue to be a part of the project. I, I'm just concerned because I noticed at the back side of, of Lake Winds, uh, I love Lake Winds, that's one of my favorite places to hide here. <laughs> um, but it's not finished and if it's gonna lay vacant like that, is there something we could be? 
Yes, we're, um, we have uh, an artist in residence that is actually working on, on a mural that would go on the backside of the co-op building. And we're working with um, the city parks and rec about creating a very temporary garden space in that, um, in that land where that's where the retail pad will eventually be. So that we could have something prettier there in the interim and it would just look a little bit better until we get the retail going. Okay. I'm gonna turn it over to council questions. You know, I, I'm just looking, the approved plan calls for completion of that 9,000 square feet of retail space. It doesn't call to leave it vacant so you can do part of it. I'm just wondering, what's the plan going forward to, to complete the full plan, not just part of it? As soon as we have a retail tenant for the retail space, we'll start on the construction of that. Well, but that doesn't tell me anything. No, I mean, it, do, it that's doesn't. That's part of the approved well, plan. What? And you're asking for an extension again on the approved plan, and that's part of it. Now you're telling us it's not part of it any longer. Who made that decision? I'm, I guess I'm c a little confused. I'm not saying it's not a part of what we eventually plan to do. It's not a part of what we would move forward with right now. If that means that we'd need to come back later for a different approval on the retail space, I guess that we would have to do that. Um, we don't have a specific tenant for the retail space right now. And I'm not sure, may maybe staff could speak more to what are the ramifications of not starting the retail now. Um, as long as the project in its entirety is, um, has substantial completion as defined by uh, December 10th, 2015, if the extension was approved, then um, it, it wouldn't have a bearing on whether or not that re retail component had started. Well, it looks like substantial completion if, in fact, they get the funding and they build the apartment unit. That's one or more, one or two permits for 10, 000, 10 million more. So all they got to do to get substantial completion is start on that apartment building, and they don't have to do anything else to be substantially complete. Is that, that a correct reading of what you're saying? Is our, is our drop dead? It is, but it would keep the um, land use approvals open. Well, and th they would have point. to continue with that substantial, you know, they would keep them open for up to another year, but they would have to meet further substantial completion on that retail component. Well, to I mean, keep it open. so, but we're back in here putting putting new criteria and new, new mandates on them, and it just keeps moving forward. I, I you know, I've been looking at this a long time, and I was excited as anybody else about it, and I'm excited that there's an investor. Um, the timeline we got is somehow that by November something's going to happen. I, to me, that's not a timeline. Once again, it's smoke and mirrors. But um, I, I guess I just look at what, what we said the last time and, and that, you know, that the extension was contingent upon substantial completion of the construction of the quasi-public improvements and securing full project funding by June 10th. It didn't happen. So personally, I'm, I'm going to vote not to extend it again. That's just my, my opinion. So. Council Member Garcia? Well, <coughs> I think uh, uh, Council Member Elliott's made some very good points and it's kind of like, uh, you know, like we're playing chess. Um, but I'm disappointed that we're not gonna have the component of affordable housing because I think that is a very important public policy issue. And, you know, just to not have it, and it's just, you know, kind of, it's such a great disappointment because it, it'd be a great part of the city to have that type of housing there. So, and that the other thing that I worry about too is um, like what um, Council Member Elliott said, you know, um, what if it's not substantially completed? You know, who makes that decision? Does staff make that decision? Yes, and that's why we were um, also requesting the definition in here of what um, we would view as substantially complete by December 10th of this year. Okay. And I and I, I don't know, I just, uh, it's, I guess to me the, the most important element would be to have that uh, affordable housing, not all the amenities. Um, because, you know, housing is the number one crisis that we have in this whole state. And if we could, you know, you know be ma make that part of our of our daily um, way of doing business with the developers, I think it would really advance the homeless uh, issue too. I will go ahead and and and, um, and vote to approve this, 
but this will probably be the last time that I would uh, that I would do that. Uh, so just to let you know. Edwina, could I just say a couple things about your concern about the affordable housing? I, I really share it. I was really disappointed. I, I don't think you um, had any more interest in having affordable housing than I did. I really thought, I really do believe that the way to provide affordable housing is to have a mix of incomes in one place. And I thought that we could convince the right funders to come to the table to create that because that's what cities want. Cities don't actually want 100% affordable housing developments. They want these mixed income kinds of developments. I, I was really surprised that we were not able to convince the funding community to put together a new tool to create this kind of housing. And until we have a new tool, it's not going to happen and it won't matter who you talk to. These, these sources don't mix right now. And so um, rather than have nothing happen, which is, is what could happen if we s stick with the affordable housing thing, we'll, we won't get it done and we certainly won't meet it in the time frame that this uh, PUD would expire. So there isn't a way to do affordable housing on this site at this time. And that's a big disappointment to me because that was part of what I wanted to accomplish here. And I'm sorry that we couldn't do that. I do think that the, um, the broader community that was involved in the community process that created the vision for this project really was much more focused on, on those public amenities and creating a gathering place for the city. And so I'm happy that we've been able to f find a way to continue to do that. And I'm sorry that we couldn't do the other. I, I agree with you that it's an important piece. And until we all figure out how to create mixed income projects. It's going to, uh, developing affordable housing is just going to be a tough business. So I'm sorry. Council Member Howard. Um, well, you know, I'm the, the new new guy in the block. Uh, and so s some of the, this is new. I, I mean, I do share some, the concern about the, the loss of affordable housing. I do think that was uh, a noble part of this project. Um, I guess I have a question for staff. What are the consequences if we don't, uh, approve this action tonight? If um, the land use approvals extension is not approved this evening, then um, the developer would have to come back um, and reapply in entirety for all new land use approvals if they wanted to continue moving forward. The land use approvals would expire on June 10th of um, 2015. Okay, thank you. I mean, I mean from my perspective, uh, I do think this is a a project that merits value for for the city and its future, and um, th the fact that we aren't able to have it exactly as uh, was set out uh, to me isn't a reason to sort of walk away at this point. And so I'm inclined to support this action to to move forward. Council Member Fitzsenter. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm not totally upset by the affordable housing going. We just heard in a meeting we just had in the back room that a lot of the residents want younger people to come in with, the, with disposable income. And with what we got going on in the Lindell area with all the upscale uh, restaurants and things going on, um, I think this is kind of getting to be the uptown version of Richfield. Uh, I think it'll attract younger people that we've been looking for to attract. Uh, we talked about that uh, just tonight in the meeting. So I'm not unhappy with it and we, we had a report that we got over 90% affordable housing in Richfield. Uh, we, it's time to uh, move it up a little bit, get upscale and get people with money that wanna live here and live in the community and spend their money here. So uh, I'm in favor of going forward with this. I'm like uh, uh, rep, uh, uh, Edwina that I don't wanna be sitting here again. <laughs> we, we dealt with this before, we got land locked up and people keep coming to us and saying, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that, I'm gonna do that. It's time to really move forward on this because uh, I'm gonna be with Edwina and say that we're, we're not gonna come uh, to the same decision that I'm coming to tonight. Next time you come to us, we're just gonna say, you've had your chance. So, okay. You know, I wanted to follow up too um, with what um, Council Member Fitzandrew said. For one thing, you know, the affordable housing um, it can attract people that are, you know, that are going to be professional folks, but maybe, maybe because you know they're they're going to to school or they have another job or whatever they're working. But I expect that the people that would buy there and that would buy affordable units are going to move up into in terms of you know being uh, decent taxpayers and and that this is just kind of helps them uh, put their foot in the door. Mm -hmm. To have decent housing. 
I, I share the, the perspectives of affordable housing and it's been my thing is every developer that comes to the city I ask for affordable housing in units. But a lot of times we don't get at the 50% AMI, which is the hardest I think to get. We get usually at the 60% AMI. And you tried to do it at the 50% and I understand that difficult push. Um, and I, I, um, I, I sat on the housing task force, I think you know that at the Met Council and very dismayed that they didn't come up with better tools uh, for, for this to make it happen. Because I think even though we have a lot of affordability in here, we, c we set the bar for a lot of communities who can still do it. Um, it's, it's very frustrating for me to hear too that we can't do this, even at a smaller percentage rate, you know, 5% or 6% or something like that. Um, I, I, I know that I, I with some other mayors will be speaking at the state level about these frustrating issues that we have at the city level to not make these projects go like this because I don't, I don't like to see this either. I like to know that somebody who's going to school or getting a professional certification that will move up in income has a really nice place because you know what we find? is that when people come and live in Ridgefield in one of these apartments, they buy a house in Ridgefield. They stay in Ridgefield. And that's what we like. We are, we are a great community. And I do like the amenities that you're, you're providing with this, but it's very sad to see this. I happen to also agree with Edwina that this will probably be the last time that you'll come with a yes <laughs> vote from you as well. <laughs> if you come back. So, you, Council Member? Yeah, I've got a question. I'm not sure if it's for Ms. Carey or for staff or both. Um, you know, we're talking about the amenities and everything, and, and Ms. Carey indicated that the resolutions kind of blur together, merge together. Um, I'm looking at the letter that uh, Beth Pfeiffer wrote to, to Karen Barton, and it offers the options and, and it indicates some, some of what the investor will or will not do depending on, on what happens tonight. But uh, what, what interests me is the, the, the Item number three in, in Ms. Pfeiffer's email to Karen it says that the public improvements at this built location are one of the strongest attractions to private investors in this submarket and this site. And then uh, it goes on to say, the, therefore, our request to the city and Met Council is that they, the Met Council, reevaluate our original proposal as a 100% market rate project with a goal of maintaining a high enough score to amend the grant in order to remove the affordability requirement while ma maintaining the entire grant amount. I need to know what that means in regards to the public amenities, which are the crux and the center point of this development. It sounds like that there's no guarantees if we go ahead and do what we're going to do tonight that uh, that, that grant's going to stay in place. And another thing is in, in uh, the staff report to us, and I'll stand corrected if I misheard this, but there's an indication that the Met Council has previously provided assurances that they would not require repayment of the grant should the project fail to be fully completed. It's my recollection that the, the, the commission members stand up here and said they never have required repayment, but I don't think they said they never would. Um, and I can look at the record to see if I'm wrong, and, and if I am, I apologize, but I don't, I don't recall them saying they would not require repayment if the project isn't completed. Um, to my recollection, uh, they said they never have done that before and that they didn't believe that they now would this is one, do that. This is one member, remember, that's telling yep. us this. That they didn't believe that they would um, require repayment of this grant if the rest of the project didn't go forward. Okay, that's a little um, bit different than saying they would not require. And again, I would have to look at the tape to see the okay. exact wording as well. I'm not positive on that. Is um, there a possibility the Met Council would pull part or all of that grant if, in fact, affordability is not part of the project? From the grant agreement, um, they do have the ability to do that, to require repayment on that. Um, when the Met Council representatives came here, um, they did that to, to provide some assurance that they they didn't feel that they would have any cause to do that. No, I'm talking about no. the affordability component now that was part and parcel of the reason they gave the grant in the first place. The, uh, um, we would have to go forward and uh, request the amendment from that council and um, referring to the grading, all the proposals that they get are scored. Um, they score them internally based on criteria and um, removing this uh, component would obviously change the scoring and it could possibly change the scoring low enough that they would say um, they're that they
they won't approve the amendment, so it either needs to go forward as is or be the rest needs to be returned, or um, the scoring would be such that they would be willing to make the amendment and um, allow the grant to be expended for the, the improvements that were indicated. And we have neither assurances or any idea how that vote or how that grading is going to go, do we? Uh, we don't at this time. I've spoken to Met Council um, about this, and the developers have spoken with them as well, and um, they're willing to look at it. And they, you know, they would like to see this project go forward as well. But um, you know, until they actually had a request from the city of Richfield to make this amendment, um, they can't say one way or another at this point. So and the amendment has to come from us? The request has to come from us because it is the city of Richfield's grant. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Would you like to make a motion? Sure. Uh, on Madam, Madam Mayor. Please. Could I, could I just interject Madam Mayor and Council? Um, for the motion, I would just make a recommendation that you include um, contingent upon the staff's recommended definition of substantial completion. If the council is inclined to mm -hmm. agree with that, and mm -hmm. um, I think that would be a good thing to include in the motion, just That's a recommendation. Okay. I think I will include that well. <laughs> uh, to approve that and um, until December at uh, 6, 6330, 6400, and 6440 Lindale. Avenue and and uh, contingent and we'll wait and see and um, and that's it so it's to approve the six month extension mm -hmm. okay with the definition as you say it Chuck yeah correct you ready to I'll second that yes any other comments or questions all in favor signify by aye aye, aye. opposed no the motion carries council member uh, Howard so I have uh, the consideration of a metro uh, Metropolitan Council Livable Communities Transportation Oriented Development Grant Amendment request relating to this Lindale Gardens project. Uh, this request is contingent upon approval of the previous agenda item, which you just adopted, uh, consideration of a resolution regarding a request for six-month extension of land use approvals uh, granted at 6330, 6400, and 6440 Lindale Avenue. If the land use approvals extension is not granted, no action will be necessary on this item. Uh, the Cornerstone Group is requesting an amendment to the Metropolitan Council's Livable Communities Development Transportation Oriented Development Program grant relating to the Lindale Gardens project, 6400 Lindale Avenue South. Since the grant was awarded to the city, the city would have to make the formal request to the Met Council. On April 25th, 2012, the city of Richfield was awarded a $1.5 million livable communities demonstration account LCDA transit oriented development uh, POD program grant from the Metropolitan Council for quasi public improvements on the Lindale Gardens property. Uh, grant funded activities include site acquisition, holding costs, trail connections, bridge connections, amphitheater, water feature, outdoor gas, fireplace, and pizza. The grant funds are intended to reimburse the, developer, the developer for the cost to construct the above mentioned quasi public improvements and are based on a finishing project that will include a co-op grocery, retail restaurants and 120 units of multifamily housing of which 20% of the units are to be affordable. The Cornerstone Group is requesting that the city and Met Council reevaluate Cornerstone's original proposal to allow for a 100% market rate multifamily housing project, removing the requirement to include 20% affordable units in the project. The developer will be presenting the request to the council on which they've done so. Do you make a motion or is there a discussion? Uh, is there, should we just make the motion? Or? Yeah, we'll discuss. Sure. Uh, and the motion is to approve or deny the request for an amendment uh, so the motion would be to approve the request for an amendment to the M Metropolitan Council Livable Communities Development Transportation Oriented Development Program grant. I'll second the discussion. Council, any discusses? I, I wanted to ask um, staff, uh, when will we know what the Met Council's final decision is? Um, I would make the 
uh, assuming this is uh, approved, I would make the recommendation um, within the next week to Met Council. And um, I'm not sure what their timeline would be, but um, okay. I would express that okay. this is an urgent request. Okay, thank you. Do you have any uh, comments or anything to add? No, except the Met Council has said that they would put it on their next agenda to consider as soon as they have the request from you. So it's a fact. Yeah, at least we would get an answer right away. Mm -hmm. I, I think this actually makes the project is to have these amenities there. So I think it's a pretty important piece of this. Mm -hmm. So, Any other comments or questions? All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you for bringing you. Um, at this time, we have uh, this uh, s uh, city manager's report. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, I really don't have any report to make. Uh, may okay. And then um, I just have one item um, I'd like to bring to the city manager quickly. Um, we did a really kind of different and, and innovative way of doing the goal setting session. Um, just wondering when probably this summer we should probably come back around and find out where that went and where it's going and to just do our, re our review. I'm sure we can set it up here soon in one of our study sessions or something. But I'm feeling it's time to circle back, circle the wagons again. Would, would you like to have that in front of a council meeting sometime? Is that yeah. how you'd like to handle it? Is that okay with everyone? Sure. We could do that, just make it a dinner meeting that, that night or something. Yeah, sure. Maybe we all sit around here and get that done. Is there any other council discussion about anything? Any other requests or anything? I just want to remind people to mow your lawns. We're going to be out looking. <laughs> the, the rain has really, and it's really hard to stay ahead of it. I'm really glad yesterday afternoon I went and mowed um, after the late in the, the afternoon because um, <laughs> otherwise it was supposed to be good today and it wasn't. So uh, please stay ahead of that. You know, we're, we're cognizant of the rain, but we will have to because there are problem properties. Please make sure that you're cutting your grass. That's always an issue. I think every year we have a lot of offenders. So. Claims and payroll? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Um, seeing no one for the open forum, I'll call the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>